Uh, so I'm Maynard Olson. Uh, I'm Professor Emeritus of uh, Medicine and Genome Sciences at the University of Washington. And uh, the emeritus part is for real. I actually did retire a few years ago and uh, spend uh, very little time at the University of Washington and uh, am involved in a variety of other activities, but not uh, any longer active in research. And I grew up in Bethesda on Edgemore Lane. Yes, my, uh, my father was an intramural NIH researcher in the, what was then called the Division of Infectious Diseases. And uh, at that time, uh, <coughs> responsibilities had not sorted out uh, between the CDC and the NIH to the degree that they have now. And uh, most of my father's work was uh, more similar to what goes on now at the CDC than what goes on at, uh, in the uh, NIAID. But uh, in any event, I kind of grew up in this uh, culture and uh, left, uh, I was born here and uh, left my senior year in high school, but uh, to the West Coast where I've spent a lot of my time since then. But uh, I went through the public schools in Bethesda, Bethesda Elementary, the no longer extant uh, Leland Junior High School and uh, BCC. I can remember uh, the NIH campus when I was uh, a young child uh, still uh, rented some of the land to a neighboring farmer to graze cows on because uh, the initial land gift here was uh, larger than uh, the NIH could put to uh, scientific use at that time. And uh, that was uh, when the NIH, particularly to the north, was surrounded by farmland. So things have changed. I was always attracted to the, to the sort of basic physical sciences and uh, probably would have uh, become a physicist, uh, but uh, particularly at Caltech, uh, you know, quickly became aware that uh, many of my peers had uh, more facility with mathematical physics than I did. Uh, I like to think that I can actually understand uh, these things, but it takes me longer than it uh, took them to. And uh, I thought chemistry would be a good compromise. It, uh, it, uh, it's a basic science. It, uh, chemists are proud of their field as being what is sometimes called the central science. That uh, whether you're a physicist or a material scientist or an environmental scientist or a biologist, you've really got to deal with chemistry. We live in a chemical world. We're chemical entities. So it was a good choice. I uh, stuck with it through graduate school, got my PhD in uh, inorganic chemistry. It was really physical inorganic chemistry, studied the mechanisms of small molecular reactions. Uh, all the while uh, ignoring uh, biology completely, it's uh, impossible to exaggerate uh, my level of ignorance about biology. It is still true to this day uh, that the only biology course of any description that I've ever taken was at uh, BCC, the 10th grade. Mr. Butterfield's uh, high school biology course. And uh, I didn't take uh, any biology in college, not even any biochemistry, uh, and uh, less so in graduate school, where I was really on the sort of chemical physics. My first paper, one thing that Francis Collins, the uh, current NIH director, and I have in common, a little known fact, is that for both of us, our first serious scientific paper was published in the uh, Journal of Chemical Physics. Uh, it's not too well known even here on campus that uh, Francis did his, uh, he was an MD, PhD, but the, uh, the uh, PhD part of it was in quantum mechanics. And, uh, so there's a long tradition of chemists migrating into uh, biology, and Francis migrated by his route. He knew a lot more biology, of course, when he did his migration because he had an MD. Uh, I uh, knew nothing, but uh, that's always been my style. I, uh, I prosper in fields where I uh, 
uh, don't know very much uh, going in uh, because some, some, something about the way I learn things uh, requires that I start from scratch. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't do well in fields where you have to start uh, with a lot of highly structured pre-existing uh, knowledge. So just for example, in chemistry, I was never good at organic chemistry. Uh, organic chemistry is a fascinating subject, but the people that are good at it uh, develop a tremendous amount of highly structured kind of pre-existing knowledge, and then they attack a new problem from that reference point. I've never been, uh, never been good at that. I uh, like to stay closer to uh, things that I've just had to sort of slowly figure out for myself. That's just a characteristic. At that time, it, uh, postdocs were actually not much of a uh, feature of the chemical education landscape. Uh, they existed, but there were relatively few of them, and they were not an obligatory step. Uh, so right out of graduate school, I took a, uh, a real job, a tenure-track job at Dartmouth College in the chemistry department, and uh, with the, still the intent of doing uh, sort of physical and organic chemistry uh, research and teaching. And uh, spent a few years there, but fairly quickly discovered this really was not a good long-term plan. I liked the teaching, but uh, sort of needed, uh, needed a fresh uh, research topic. And uh, To a, so molecular biology was an obvious uh, one to look at. It was a very exciting period in molecular biology, the, the period after the discovery of the double helix and kind of the working out of the genetic code and the mechanism of protein synthesis and so forth. That had kind of stabilized, but there was a big sort of what next kind of question hovering over molecular biology at that time that even an outsider such as myself could... Uh, could grasp and was strongly attracted to, uh, that uh, there were, of course, a lot of molecular biologists that were eager to get on with studying uh, the more, what were then the traditional topics of, you know, basically transcription, translation, control of transcription, and so forth, uh, in ever more mechanistic detail. That didn't appeal to me. Uh, I had actually done a lot of mechanistic studies in chemistry, mechanisms of reactions, and that was part of what I wanted to get away from. Uh, my view was that these highly reductionist approaches uh, uh, are extremely effective in their early phase, and then uh, fairly quickly uh, uh, get into a phase of diminishing returns. So I was not interested in, in that. Uh, asymptotic sort of phase. I wanted to get in on the more ground floor of something and the, uh, so with the rather vague uh, ideas of this sort in mind, I uh, negotiated an early sabbatical from Dartmouth. Uh, I did some extra summer teaching and so forth. I really wasn't eligible for a sabbatical, but took one anyway. And uh, it's a complicated and sort of personal story as to how I ended up in Seattle, but uh, my sabbatical was in, uh, at the University of Washington. Uh, we will discover, uh, if we keep on this uh, biographical track, that uh, you know, my relationship with the University of Washington is less straightforward than it might seem. Uh, people like to uh, give formal introductions of me because... Uh, I was at the University of Washington. I went then to Washington University and then back to the University of Washington and, uh, of course, was born in Washington, D.C. So, uh, in any event, this was my first phase at the University of Washington, was on sabbatical from Dartmouth, working in the laboratory of Ben Hall, who's a, a uh, highly distinguished uh, uh, molecular biologist who shared a few things with me that made us a really good match. His PhD was in chemistry, uh, biological chemistry to be sure. He worked on nucleic acids, but from a very chemical point of view, Paul Doty, uh, he, uh, and he likes to do new things. If you look at uh, Ben Hall's uh, CV, 
it's a series of new things. He has a, an attention span of about five years, and uh, then he moves on to something really new. And uh, I was a bit like that, although I like to think my attention span is longer, maybe 10 to 15 years, but uh, I also like to move on to things that are uh, new. Uh, so what was kind of new for us uh, was, uh, you know, somehow, this is, sounds an absurdly vague idea, but uh, it's pretty much the way we talked about it at the time, is that the molecular genetics of uh, at least simple eukaryotes, uh, we were working on yeast, Saccharomyces, uh, was uh, actually very well developed uh, by uh, 1974 when I showed up in Ben's lab. Uh, quite an impressive intellectual and technical edifice doing Mendelian analysis in yeast. See, unlike uh, bacteria, where most of the early molecular biology was done, you know, yeast has Mendelian genetics. In fact, it, its Mendelian genetics uh, has often been described as sort of so good it looks like it was designed by a geneticist. It, uh, it's an immensely better organism than peas or people to do Mendelian genetics on for various kind of technical reasons, and this was all quite well developed. Uh, there was no molecular genetics uh, in yeast, a little biochemical, what we would call biochemical genetics, sort of protein level, uh, and a few interesting uh, fusions between the Mendelian genetics and the biochemical genetics, but uh, nothing that we would currently really think of as molecular genetics. But 1974 was the year that the first recombinant DNA papers were published, and uh, they were much on uh, Ben's mind and actually mine. Uh, I read about them in the New York Times. Uh, I have a somewhat famous uh, f first front page paper in the New York Times about the development of recombinant DNA uh, methods, uh, Cohen and Boyer's work. And it's mostly famous because the an intellectual property lawyer at Stanford read this article and told the uh, university that, gee, they should look into patentability of this method, which uh, neither Boyer nor uh, Cohen had considered. And they were right at the kind of the deadline for doing that, but uh, managed to get a patent. I read about it and said, wow, this uh, sounds like uh, you're going to be able to get at genes as sort of chemical entities. And uh, there was actually, you know, a lot of nice work in bacteria that had been done kind of getting at the genes, but it was all done biologically by, you know, these rather esoteric methods like transduction and, uh, you know, with uh, prophages that excised imperfectly and various things. Just the vocabulary tells you that uh, this is a very biological approach. Cohen and Boyer, I could understand this. You know, you get these molecules and uh, you uh, manipulate them. That's what chemists do. And uh, then you put them into cells. And, uh, and there was a generality to it all that greatly appealed to me. And also it fit the criterion that I outlined earlier that uh, nobody knew anything about these methods. Uh, they, uh, Ben Hall and uh, it was there was, was really interested in getting them going in his lab, but didn't have them going. Uh, the only person in Seattle who had any experience with them was Stan uh, Falco, who uh, is, was, was even then and is certainly now a sort of distinguished uh, student of the molecular genetics of bacterial pathogens. And uh, that was key because, of course, it was bacterial technology and he was uh, much ahead of anyone in the genetics department where I was. And uh, so we learned some things from him about uh, doing recombinant DNA. But anyway, there was no knowledge base. And uh, our goals were vague. We wanted to get the Mendelian genetics sort of together with the, uh, with the uh, recombinant DNA methods. And uh, that I was good for this, to take on this project because uh, you know, the biologists uh, in Ben's lab and the genetics department, you know, they all had this uh, functional orientation. 
And so they were always looking for some project that would uh, teach them something functionally about biology. I was ideal because, uh, although of course I understood that function, I understood then and understand now that function is, uh, is really the ultimate goal in biology. Uh, I looked at what people were actually doing to learn about function and the methods all seemed to me just so hopelessly underpowered. I was coming from chemistry where we actually had some tools <laughs> and uh, you know, we had NMR, we uh, had uh, you know, very sophisticated spectroscopy, we had, uh, we had uh, stable isotopes and radioisotopes and uh, so forth. We uh, had a lot of tools and uh, we could actually learn something about the functions of molecules. You know, looking around the genetics department, they, I loved the environment that people were in, you know, they're very smart. You know, Lee Hartwell was right at the kind of the peak of his, uh, you know, getting his, his approach to studying the cell cycle off the ground. You know, these were, he was another Caltech graduate. I hit it off uh, early on with him when he was a young faculty member there and stayed in touch with him for, you know, throughout our, both of our careers. But they, I, lo I love the people, I like the environment, but I looked at what they were doing. You know, they had toothpicks and petri plates and they were sort of streaking these colonies out and uh, using velveteen. I don't know, this, this wasn't going to get us very, we weren't going to learn very much uh, about functional biology by these methods. Uh, so uh, I wasn't concerned about getting a project that would get me to study function. Uh, yeah, I wanted to get these methods kind of uh, sort of um, I wanted, I wanted to work on methods because I thought that's what, that's what this field needed was immensely more powerful methods and, uh, and recombinant DNA looked like the uh, foothold. So that was kind of my postdoc was uh, working uh, on that and it, you know, it, it went well actually. Uh, and I think a lot of it was our, uh, our point of view. Uh, and also uh, another thing about chemists is that uh, Chemical experimentation is a very, like, because of all these methods and so forth, a much more sophisticated business. Chemists are not easily discouraged uh, by experimental problems. In fact, uh, chemistry was way past the stage even then, and is even much farther past it now, when you could hope to discover anything uh, interesting in chemistry uh, without developing new methods. Uh, you know, the methods had been, you know, the methods that were very well understood had been applied uh, exhaustively and if you really wanted to learn something new about molecules, you needed some new way of setting them. Uh, so I was quite comfortable with this uh, whole uh, notion and, uh, you know, I think a uh, uh, key to Ben and my approach is that we were kind of scrappy experimentalists and uh, didn't give up easily and, uh, and there were a lot of experimental problems. but. Uh, the uh, it did go it did go well we uh, you know, we really combined I don't know how much uh, detail it's worth going into but we I think uh, we we combined Mendelian genetics and molecular genetics in some reasonably uh, new ways and uh, didn't learn anything functionally I think I left Ben's lab not having learned one new fact uh, about the uh, yeast cells uh, that you know, how they do things, but uh, we knew a lot more about uh, the genome and the genes, uh, how they were organized, how, uh, and, and more, more than anything else, kind of how to get at them than uh, we knew uh, five years earlier when I had first come there. So anyway, it, it went well right from the beginning, so I, 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 I quit my job at Dartmouth and uh, went, uh, went back to uh, Went back to Ben's lab. I took a few. I had to take a few months to settle my affairs at Dartmouth, and then I got back. I basically spent five uh, pretty continuous years there, and it was during that period that I collaborated uh, with Ron Davis. Uh, I was actually only in Ron Davis's lab for one week. Ron, Ron and I still sort of joke about this uh, that uh, the uh, but Ben had arranged this collaboration. I I didn't know anything about work in Ron's lab, but uh, Ben recognized that he really was at the cutting edge of recombinant DNA techniques then and uh, that expertise did, didn't exist in Seattle and uh, 
they, he arranged anyway. Uh, Ron hosted me. Uh, he had an extremely talented graduate student, uh, John Cameron, who was, I worked with, uh, you know, kind of at the lab bench. John, interestingly, uh, later went into clinical uh, medicine, psychiatry, I think, and uh, did not pursue a uh, molecular biological research career, but he was, uh, to this day, is one of the very best experimentalists I've ever seen uh, at the lab bench. And so in a week, I learned how to uh, make Lambda clone libraries and uh, screen them and uh, brought that back to Seattle, and that was uh, one key part of our uh, uh, success was uh, having some of – one of Ron's uh, many contributions to molecular biology was that, uh, you know, he also came from a chemistry department, just as an aside, in fact, the Caltech chemistry department. But uh, he, uh, he also simply believed that, uh, that these uh, technical problems that were ubiquitous in molecular genetics at that time uh, not only needed more work, but they, they needed good solutions. I think that's the one thing I learned from Ron. Don't settle you know, for a halfway solution that barely gets you by your immediate need. Uh, if, the, if the problem is a, uh, you know, is a sort of fairly fundamental one, uh, technically speaking, solve it well, uh, because then that solution will have a whole variety of applications, not just to your project, but that's how the field really advances. The attitude, uh, this attitude served me extremely well, uh, and I really did get this from Ron, the, uh, the tradition in molecular biology, I mean, I was hardly the only person who discovered that it was hard to do these experiments and make them work. Uh, but the tradition was a scraping by tradition that uh, you get this stuff just to work well enough to do your project. Kind of, and uh, I got much more of this attitude from Ron that uh, you should get these methods working uh, well. And then when you move to the next step of complexity, get those methods working well. That uh, you can't really build on methods if you're just scraping by. I mean, I'm you know, a huge fan of Ron's. I had this early contact with him, but I've admired his work ever since. He, uh, a few years ago, I was pleased that uh, I, was, I was on the selection committee for the Gruber Prize in genetics, which is a, kind of a major prize, and, and I was uh, able to play it significant role in persuading them to award this to Ron because I, I think he's under underappreciated. Uh, yeah, his contributions are so ubiquitous and so manifold that it's uh, hard to know where to start. I, I remember in the, in, the Gruber, uh, in the Gruber discussions that, uh, that Jasper Ryan, a uh, star postdoc of Ron's, uh, wrote a, a letter of support and I was joking with Jasper about this uh, letter that uh, I think that I'm not revealing anything here that's uh, meaningfully confidential. I think all parties here would be happy to know about this story. That uh, he violated every, every known rule in writing this letter uh, for, we all write a lot of letters like this, and he violated every known rule because it was about five pages long and it rambled from uh, this to the next to the next to the next. Uh, but that's what was needed. I mean, if you go through Ron's uh, contributions, uh, you know, it is many things. Uh, and if I, my, my best unifying theme is the one I've already used, is that uh, he chose, he, he was largely methodological. It's actually hard to associate Ron's long career with learning anything about how cells work. I'm sure he would come up with some examples, but they're not what stick. Uh, it was, uh, he, he, had, he recognized the difference between uh, kind of a protocol and a method, uh, that uh, a method is, uh, you know, some new source of leverage that, uh, that can be used to address a very wide range of problems. So the, I think that early, early on, he really was the one who got recombinant DNA working uh, on scale, you know, that, uh, it wasn't a question of getting, you know, a few hundred clones and hoping that yours was one of them. Uh, the one you were looking for was one of them. Uh, it was a question of, you know, making libraries from uh, complex genomes that had a hundred 
X coverage uh, so that even things that were way underrepresented would still be there. And methods of screening these libraries uh, effectively in a, you know, in a day or two, not through some long complicated thing. Uh, that was an early phase. Um, but he always understood uh, much better than I did uh, when I went to his lab. Uh, I, it was another thing I remember discussions when I was there that influenced me. We didn't do these experiments, but how uh, he had a much more biological view of genes than I did. I had a chemist view of genes. You know, these are polymers, and uh, they, uh, yeah, they had interesting functional effects. But that was I was above my pay grade. Um, Ron uh, understood that uh, genes were, you know, their interest in genes. They were boring polymers. They were they were interesting because of their functional effects uh, and that you had to study these functional effects by getting genes into cells and uh, that was a major theme of a sort of middle phase of his career was many different ways of uh, taking genes from anywhere and getting them into cells usually predominantly yeast cells and the the real strength of his of the, the, all of the applications of yeast transformation that he developed is that he wanted to have very tight genetic control over the genes once they were there. <clears throat> you know, you can do a complementation test just by getting the DNA in there and as long as it gets expressed fairly quickly, transient assays and various things uh, dominated the literature for a long time. Uh, Ron wanted to be able to make a chromosome out of it. He wanted to, uh, to put it in a chromosome. He wanted to be able to replace the, uh, you know, the gene copy that uh, was there to begin with uh, exactly with uh, no other alterations. He wanted to be able to have them at high copy number. Um, uh, not all at once, of course. These are different goals. And so uh, he uh, gradually developed you know, building on work, <laughs> there was a lot of good work being done in yeast at that time and uh, centromeres and telomeres, uh, replication origins. I think Ron's main contribution was to the replication origin story. But uh, you, know, you need to know all these functional parts of a chromosome uh, to uh, have this kind of control. And that became important later in my career. Uh, I, I think uh, was a, you know, obviously a direct influence on, on building yaks because uh, they were yeast artificial chromosomes and uh, they differed actually from uh, the kind of thing Ron Davis had been doing much earlier uh, only in that uh, you know, they involved uh, large, large segments of exogenous DNA as opposed to the few thousand base pairs that were the kind of 19... 70s and early 80s recombinant DNA technology. So anyway, uh, he's uh, and, and and he's gone on and done uh, you know still more things. I think uh, <clears throat> there's not an, any kind of direct lineage between Ron and uh, you know say the next generation as it's called for some odd reason sequencing, uh, but uh, but there are many indirect links because he understood that DNA sequencing was too hard and uh, needed to be done much better and he explored kind of many approaches to that problem and trained a lot of people uh, that uh, played a key role in developing next-gen sequencing and uh, is, uh, I think of him as kind of the uh, godfather of next generation sequencing. He's not the father of it, but he's sort of the godfather. Uh, but he had a big influence on me. Now, one of the characteristics of Ron's methods is that they work. <laughs> and uh, that's not a shock and awe issue because, uh, it, you know, the shock and awe is all about somebody got the thing to work once uh, under, you know, some tenuous, the scraping by kind of environment. And uh, that's when people pay attention because it's new you know, uh, Dolly or something is, uh, you know, was not a, not a method, you know, not a protocol anyone else could follow and took many years of work to, uh, to make it possible even to clone sheep uh, with any regularity, much less mice and so forth. But uh, if you're working within a field, uh, there's a big difference between the scrape by phase and uh, really having a good experimental control over the system you're working with. Yeah, so that project uh, 
was uh, kind of a natural outgrowth of what I did in Ben's lab. Uh, I didn't work on the project in Ben's lab, but, uh, but by the end I was thinking about it. Ben used to uh, affectionately refer to it as my megalomaniac project. But, uh, and I don't think that was a compliment actually, but uh, I, uh, you know, we had all the raw materials uh, to integrate the genetic and physical maps, uh, but didn't know how to do it uh, on scale. Basically, this project I did on tyrosine tRNA genes in Ben's lab involved uh, integration of, of the global genetic map, because it was, had been built by then at, uh, globally, uh, with toothpicks and petri plates. But, uh, the, uh, and we, we did physical map correlations using this cloning technology, like from Ron's lab, uh, did uh, local correlations of uh, little chunks of the physical map uh, with chunks of the genetic map or loci on the genetic map. Uh, but it was, you know, quite clear that the next step would be to have a complete physical map of yeast at, you know, sort of gene size resolution. Uh, genes in yeast are not very big, and so it, you know, it had to have a resolution of, say, a few kb uh, at least. And uh, yeast has a 15 million base pair genome, and so you, you're talking about, uh, you know, mapping uh, thousands or, you know, perhaps 10,000 sites. And uh, restriction maps of those days, you know, they had 10 sites on them, uh, not, uh, not 10,000. Uh, the methods just wouldn't scale. They they weren't very reliable, actually, even those 10 sites because of the methods that they had used. Uh, just good enough, that was this. So I, I had begun thinking pretty formally about this problem, uh, uh, especially the last year I was in Ben's lab. And by then I finally you know, could market myself as a geneticist, despite the fact that I still hadn't taken any biology courses. Uh, and. Uh, and so I was looking, looking for jobs and, and found a very good one at Washington University in St. Louis where they were building a brand new genetics department and uh, they, um, you know, I don't know, we had a kind of a shared uh, view of where genetics needed to go with, uh, I think the zero-basedness was very important. I, I was not an attractive candidate to uh, the best well-established genetics departments because I, they could always find somebody uh, better qualified than I was to do any particular thing. Uh, but uh, we had this kind of zero-based kind of idea. You know, Bob Waterston uh, was on the search committee that, uh, that uh, hired me at WashU. In any event, uh, as I was making that transition while I was still in Ben's lab, I uh, started thinking about this problem of how to, uh, how you actually would build a physical map across the whole genome. I could picture pretty well how to do the correlation with the genetics map, but uh, it wasn't so obvious how to build a physical map. And uh, I, um, but I had the basic idea by the time I left Ben's lab. Uh, one, uh, I think the major influence on me during that year uh, was Kim Naismith, who's uh, gone on to have a very distinguished career doing functional <laughs> molecular genetics. Uh, uh, Kim wanted to understand how cells do what they do, you know, chromosomes, synapse, and so forth. What are the mechanisms? And he has excelled at, uh, at that. Uh, but he, uh, he, 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 was interested in, uh, in this idea of building a physical map and was really the person I talked talk to the most about it. And the, you know, so the method I, I decided, decided on was a generalization of what uh, Kim and I, in particular in Ben's lab, were already doing. And I think anybody who was doing recombinant DNA uh, experiments sort of well, meaning in the Ron Davis uh, style, did did what we did, is that because in the Ron Davis style, you didn't just get one clone and then go on and study it. Uh, you know, you got 20 or 50. Uh, and uh, 
and the way you avoided artifacts was that uh, they had to build, you had to be able to build a self-consistent physical map locally out of these clones. And uh, if you couldn't do that, then uh, that was a good criterion for throwing out uh, spurious false positives from the screen and so forth. And uh, so you would, uh, you know, you typically would be probing for essentially a point on the chromosome with a hybridization probe. And uh, you would get a bunch of clones that uh, hybridized. Or uh, Kim was starting to do this functionally. So he was selecting for, uh, by complementation, in a, uh, a yeast recombinant DNA library going into yeast. Uh, but it's the same idea, is that he was insisting that uh, some particular point or modest number of base pairs be in all the clones, but the libraries we, Ron Davis always says, he, he made r libraries with random endpoints. That was a part of the Ron Davis dogma. So in Ben's lab, we made libraries with random endpoints. There are a lot of reasons why that's a good idea. Uh, so you, you would get out a bunch of clones uh, that uh, all had some point in them, but they had random endpoints. And you'd cut them with restriction enzymes and run them on a gel. And you know, they would share various numbers of restriction fragments depending on how much they overlapped. They would share the restriction fragments in their overlap. So we had done a lot of that. <coughs> and uh, that seemed to me a method that would generalize to the whole genome. Just skip the probing step make a Ron Davis quality kind of library and just start picking clones. And the numbers were not that intimidating, at least for yeast. Uh, yeast has a 15, roughly 15 million base pair genome. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you, you could get uh, uh, inserts <coughs> with, uh, in lambda clones, which we were, we were using at the time, with, that were 15,000 base pairs. So one X coverage of the yeast genome would just be 1,000 clones. So we could get that many on one Petri plate. And uh, you know, Poisson considerations uh, suggested that even if allowing for some non-randomness in the sampling, uh, that 10,000 clones or something should be enough. Well, you know, that's a, a lot uh, looked at one way, but uh, it, uh, the, the uh, appealing thing about it was uh, that uh, you just, uh, it, there's a linearity to the experimental work. Uh, if you needed uh, twice as many clones, it was only twice as many work, much work, or somewhat less than that because of economies of scale. Uh, but the number of pairwise combinations uh, that you could consider at the data analysis step, uh, when is the square of the number of clones? And uh, so obviously I plan to do that in a computer. Uh, so this seemed like the ideal approach is that we uh, make the experimental work linear and uh, then make the map building uh, the n squared process. So if, if we were going to do 10,000 clones, then we'd do 100 million comparisons. and. Uh, and that was not computationally daunting. It, it wasn't entirely trivial uh, for the computers of, of, of 1980, but it wasn't daunting. You know, I knew enough about computational complexities. I'd, I'd been using computers when I was at Stanford in the chemistry department, and I uh, used them quite a bit at Dartmouth, where uh, John Kemeny had been a leader in, uh, in really getting you know, uh, time-shared computing terminals out there where students and faculty could use them. You know, instead of having a computer in Stanford, I used to walk out through the eucalyptus trees to some, you know, air-conditioned building that was away from the center of things where they had a huge computer and uh, type out punched cards and uh, put them into the machine and leave them for an overnight batch run and so forth. At Dartmouth, I got this idea, sort of the Kemi, you know, Kemi is sort of a Ron Davis of computing. I, you know, I don't think he, I don't think there was any uh, fundamental uh, contribution really uh, to, you know, to computer science. He was a mathematician, uh, but he understood that computers should be used. They should be integrated into everything. He was a, sort of a Johnny Appleseed of this, and he became president of Dartmouth and uh, quite prominent. 
and uh, Dartmouth really pioneered. They developed ba the basic language at uh, Dartmouth. Uh, yeah, so it, you know, it's not a modern language, but the name is important. He wanted a language that, uh, you know, w that wouldn't have a steep learning curve. He wanted Dartmouth students to learn it and then figure out what to do with it themselves, not, to, you know, not have some highly structured assignments, but uh, get it involved in their work. That, a lot of that rubbed off on me when I was on the faculty there. And so actually I didn't use computers at all in Ben's lab. We didn't have any, and I didn't, I didn't use them at all. But I, I, I knew that uh, we, could, we, could do the, we could do the n squared comparisons, and I was pretty confident that we could do the n kind of complexity uh, experimental work. So uh, now, of course, I hugely underestimated how hard it would be, uh, but you have to. You don't start projects if you think they're going to be as hard as they turn out to be. Uh, the amazing thing is, I actually is that I got a grant. There was, you know, there was no, there was no genome uh, kind of uh, the term genomics had not yet been invented. Uh, uh, there were no, you know, there was no place to send these grants. Uh, there were no reviewers that were qualified to review them. Uh, there weren't any genome grants. I, I, I'm quite confident that if you went through the vast archives at the NIH that you would find this was the first genome grant to come in the door and to the, uh, that anybody would recognize this is a genome grant. <laughs> the amazing thing is it was funded. You know, they, you know there's this argument, well, you know, they don't really fund things that are that far off the wall, but it went, it went to GMS and uh, was reviewed by the genetic study section, which uh, David Remondini was the uh, executive uh, secretary of, and uh, had a lot of yeast geneticists on it and fly geneticists, a model organism oriented uh, section. The, although it was called the genetic section, I, I served on it for many years later. Uh, it, uh, they didn't do mammalian genetics. It was, this was, uh, they basically did plant genetics and model organisms. And uh, so they got this grant, and uh, you know it had a. I think you know it had a. It had a cerebral tradition. I, I saw that later. Uh, I don't know who the uh, actual reviewers were, uh, but they they liked it. And uh, here I was, as assistant professor. I had no preliminary data. I did. Uh, I had done some. Uh, I did some computer simulations when I got right when I first got to St. Louis. There were no computers in our new genetics department, but. Uh, I, uh, I found some over in an epidemiology kind of unit and uh, found a, a mainframe that uh, punched cards again. I remembered a key point when the deadline for the grant was uh, getting close. I dropped my deck of cards on the shuttle bus. And uh, at that time, the, the, the instructions in a computer program, they were just ordered by uh, having the cards in order. And I dropped the deck. and. Uh, and had to uh, reconstruct the program uh, by uh, shuffling the cards and uh, <laughs> getting it working uh, by the next morning and so forth. But I had done some computer simulations that showed that, I, that, uh, that at least on, on simulated data, I would actually be able to build a map. Uh, I didn't have any, didn't have any, uh, any preliminary data. Anyway, amazingly, it was funded, five-year five year grant to a new assistant professor to do something that uh, was just off the wall. You know, it, they weren't choosing the best of many grants of this kind. They'd never seen anything like it and uh, wished me well. Uh, so I started to work and, um, and yeah, that went on for, it, it was uh, a good solid ten years uh, before we had uh, a map that kind of uh, still was not perfect, but was uh, pretty good and well correlated with the genetics map, the genetic map, and widely useful even in that time to yeast geneticists. Uh, so I had to get the grant renewed once. I actually the grant for another five years, and. Uh, this just shows how much times have changed. So we'd published, uh, I think, about three papers in the five years. And they were all purely, uh, they were component methodologies, uh, how to do this part of it and this part of it. Uh, we had not yet published our first paper uh, showing that the method was going to work, that we could actually put these component uh, technologies together and, uh, and make them, make a map. And uh, 
and it got renewed for another five years. So uh, I think that happened because by then uh, uh, the, the project was well known in the yeast community. It was not well known generally, but it was well known in the yeast community. And, and uh, we were from time to time able to help other yeast geneticists with their problems in some part of the genome or another. Most of yeast genetics at that time involved, uh, you know, cloning and analyzing you know, little segments of the genome. And from time to time, uh, we could be helpful, and people could see, you know, they, they I presented data at meetings, and they, you know, they could see this was this was going to work. Uh, needed just a little patience, and uh, so. That went on. You know, it was not a big project. I did a lot of the work myself, and uh, never had more than I ne never had a student or postdoc working on it. Uh, that was true, actually, for the whole course of the project. You know, it was me and uh, one or two technicians, and uh, in the later stages, I would have usually one computer programmer, and uh, the. Uh, so that's why it kind of went slowly. But the pace was actually about right. I think this is an important point that's not well understood about uh, these early stages of technology is that if I'd had a lot more money, uh, there's no assurance whatsoever that it would have gone better and it might have gone worse. Because uh, the reality is we didn't know how to, we constantly ran into problems. And we didn't know how to solve these problems. Uh, brute force never works. You cannot solve problems that you, you don't know how to solve by brute force. You have to do some trial and error. Uh, it's very difficult to parallelize. You, know, you can't have one person trying one thing and one person trying another and some Darwinian kind of uh, struggle. I've never seen that work. Uh, you, know, you know, you need a small group, a very small group, uh, that uh, figures out how to solve these problems, and, uh, and it's uh, difficult to rush. This is a generalization about the history of genomics, is that it's really hard to explain. You know, you take some Silicon Valley type. I mean, they're the worst. Uh, they're the worst because, uh, you know, they're smart uh, and uh, think that the kind of uh, lessons that they've learned from the growth of IT generalized to all of life. And uh, you try to explain to them, you know, why it was, you know, why it took this long, it took as long as it did. Uh, it was only, uh, you know, from the time I started working on the yeast map, uh, that was 1979, uh, you know, to when the Human Genome Project uh, had, had a fairly good sequence of the human genome. Uh, it was only uh, a little over 20 years, and uh, the uh, number of people working in the field sort of grew exponentially, and funding grew exponentially through that whole period. And, and eventually, the field was mature enough that a lot of parallel trial and error could go on. But anyway, to try to explain, you know, why it, uh, you know, why it took 20 years uh, to uh, somebody in IT is difficult because and, and, and the core reason is that they, they're not dealing with the real world. They're dealing with a, um, an idealized world that they create. That's what computer science is. It's an idealized world. Uh, you know, the transistors are on or they're off. You know, a bit is either set or it's not set. And uh, the uh, deductive logic and uh, the uh, combinatoric uh, kind of finite mathematics uh, works and applies, and uh, now most of them don't actually understand what was going on with, uh, with the electrical engineering side of computers. I mean, to get computers reliable enough uh, so that they, uh, so, so that software could become the major problem uh, took many decades. Uh, because a real transistor, of course, is not on or off. You know, it's a complicated device that, uh, you know, has its own ideas about it. There are big quality control problems, all these kinds of things. Uh, but that's not part, actually, of the Silicon Valley legend. The Silicon Valley legend is uh, that somebody else, uh, you know, figured out how to build these chips. 
that were reliable enough that everything became a software problem. And uh, well, in in uh, uh, recombinant DNA techniques, just in experimental biology, uh, you're not working with materials that are as uh, easily modeled as uh, doped silicon, and uh, so we had you know bigger problems everywhere you look, and uh, they were messy problems, and uh, they uh, took a lot of trial and error, and. Uh, this is a history of the Human Genome Project that has not been written and uh, is worth looking at is you know, really actually what were kind of, even if you write a pure Whig history of the Human Genome Project, uh, uh, much less a history that captures the confusion uh, that prevailed at, uh, along the way. Uh, uh, you would quickly identify uh, at least a couple of dozen, and that would be a very sparse list of, uh, of problems that got solved uh, that proved to be critical uh, that uh, no one recognized uh, very far in advance of sort of colliding with this kind of problem and uh, where there were where there was uh, no consensus about what the best way of solving the problem would be. And, uh, and often even the people who solved the problems uh, didn't recognize the, the really, the really uh, high bounces <laughs> where, the, where, where the solutions that had unintended consequences and uh, they uh, good unintended consequences, that is they uh, they affected uh, multiple things. I mean, I just could give a very trivial example uh, would be that uh, in the in four color fluorescence sequencing, uh, you know, uh, it still depended uh, you know, on uh, electrophoresis with single nucleotide resolution. Uh, you know, these are polymer molecules. They that actually how they migrate actually the, their sequence actually matters, not just their length, whereas the kind of the the idealized model depended on single nucleotide resolution by length, uh, but independence of sequence. Uh, and so you got these compressions and unsequenceable sequences uh, because the molecules adopted odd conformations and so forth. And uh, people tried running the gels very hot and putting in a lot of denaturants and so forth. None of it worked very well. Uh, a major breakthrough, and the only one, but a major breakthrough was that for completely independent reasons, uh, the, uh, the fluorescent labeling uh, kind of went from, uh, uh, from uh, sort of five prime end labeling to three prime end labeling of these molecules with uh, dye terminators. And the, the dyes, uh, you know, were so highly decorated, the, the uh, nucleotides that were being added at the, were so heavily uh, decorated with all this organic chemistry that didn't belong there uh, that it, uh, it turned out to interfere with the formation of the hairpin structures at the end of, ends of a lot of these molecules that caused a lot of these compressions and unsequenceable regions. So that was an example of an unintended consequence of a couple of different things, going to dye terminators, making these energy transfer dyes, which required a lot, of, lot more modification of the nucleotides. And it, you know, it solved a problem that had lingered for years and years, uh, largely solved a problem that had lingered for years and years. And, and there are many other examples. But uh, anyway, our 10 years on the yeast project, I, you know, I, I, it's a, that would be a micro, micro history. Uh, but I could, uh, I could defend most of them. Obviously, I made, you know, there are some places you just find I made a mistake, read the data that we already had wrong, and in retrospect, it was pretty obvious I should have done something different. But, uh, but on the whole, uh, I can defend most of that time in this way. You know, we just had to get, uh, kind of muddle through. And, uh, but always using kind of the Ron Davis rule that, that you know, of course, Initially, you muddle through, but then you figure out, you know, what, what, what's, what am I basically doing right that's solving this problem, and let's really understand the problem now and uh, make this a robust solution. Because genomics has always been, experimental genomics uh, has always been at 
you know, very frustrating from a process point of view. Uh, yeah, it has a zillion steps, and, uh, and, 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 and there's no, none of them is strongly rate limiting. This is a process engineer's nightmare, is, uh, you know, many, many steps, you know, starting with, you know, some blood that's drawn from a, you know, a patient and uh, ending up with a GenBank file. There are all these steps, and uh, the, uh, and, and, and there really is just not a rate limiting step in there. There's nothing even there, you know, there are 10 or 15 steps that, uh, you know, very slight changes in the way that you're doing things can shift the, shift the burden. Uh, but even then, they're not typically strongly rate limiting. And so that means that no one thing you do is going to have a big effect. That's just reality. And uh, that's as true today as it was then. It's just the way it is. Now, of course, the, you know, the, the methods are much better now, and there are fewer steps. There are still a lot, but there are fewer steps, and, uh, and they work better. Uh, but there's not, you tell me, what, what's the rate-limiting step in clinical sequencing? You know, you've got a cancer patient, you want data now. Uh, you know, you take a blood sample or a tumor biopsy or something, and uh, you want a whole genome sequence of this thing. Uh, uh, well, there are a series of steps that you've got to go through. And, uh, and making any one of them uh, go, even go away completely doesn't actually change the throughput very much because it's just the way it is. And, uh, and these are messy materials, as I said. This is not doped silicon. Uh, we don't have good models for most of these steps, actually. So there's a lot of empirical work that goes into characterizing uh, kind of <coughs> how you get robust protocols. But that's... Uh, so that was the yeast map. Uh, you know, it 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 um, it worked. It took a long time. The uh, we had good, you know, good relations from really the beginning with uh, the only other project, which was John Sulston and Alan Coulson's uh, nematode project. That was I uh, learned. Bob Waterston was the uh, intermediary because uh, he trained with like like. Uh, uh, I guess like John Sulston, but John Sulston had been part of Sidney Brenner's kind of MRC nematode group. I'm not sure what exactly what his role was, uh, how you know how that happened. But uh, anyway, he was a card-carrying member of that small group. Bob Bob Waterston uh, was a near charter member himself, having postdoc there, and uh, and he was uh, you know he was my neighbor at. Uh, and cheerleader, chief cheerleader, uh, through this whole yeast project phase uh, at uh, Wash U. And so he was uh, in close touch with John and, and uh, was the only person initially who realized that I was setting out on this yeast project and uh, they were setting out on this worm project with similar goals. And, and certainly uh, closely related methods, the, the, the methods differed in detail. Uh, but, uh, but they were random, both random clone strategies that involved uh, getting these restriction digests, the N, you know, N complexity picking of uh, clones and uh, N squared complexity uh, map assembly uh, by, in a computer. And uh, so they, you know, you can't have better competitors than these. You know, they first of all were you know, really great people, uh, outstanding scientists and uh, just uh, you know, pleasure to interact with, and we traded a lot of uh, information throughout. And and uh, importantly, uh, we both had the similar attitudes toward what we were doing, and uh, were both reluctant to publish uh, kind of a landmark paper uh, because it was we had too many problems, and uh, didn't want to sweep them under the rug. Uh, but finally, uh, Sidney Brenner, who had been watching all this pretty close up, uh, sort of decreed that it was time for papers. And uh, so he instructed uh, John to write one and me to write one. And uh, can't say no to Sidney Brenner. Uh, you know, obviously it was very generous for scientists of his stature to uh, take such an interest in this. and. Uh, he communicated these two papers back to back, and in, uh, in the PNAS, uh, 
in uh, 1986. And, uh, and that was, he was absolutely right. He, he had a much better sense of the kind of politics, if you like, of genomics. He saw that the, 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 that, was, that was kind of the end of the period when, uh, you know, these, you know, small groups could work year after year after year pretty much on their own uh, with essentially no competition and not much interest in what they were doing and uh, that it was, uh, you know, going to become a big field and uh, would, would have uh, the, the, acquire the dynamic of a big field as opposed to a peripheral activity within molecular biology and genetics. <clears throat> so we did, we published these papers and, you know, we were, we were both, I think, at essentially the same stage. Uh, they were working on a bigger genome, but they, you know, they, they, uh, they were, you know, they adjusted details of their strategy so that the amount of work that they had done was comparable to the amount of work we'd done. The, uh, they had the same continuity problems that we did, and, uh, but also had the same successes. You know, they were, you know, we were both at the stage where we were building very good contigs. <clears throat> they were disappointingly small. Uh, typically, uh, you know, the typical contig was only a couple of tiling links of whatever kind of clones you built them out of. And uh, now my computer sim simulations, once I got the cards all in the right order in my uh, deck of cards. Back in, you know, many years before when I had simulated the problem, I got bigger contigs. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. But uh, that problem actually continued to plague uh, genomics uh, and uh, is not totally gone today. <laughs> the main reason that the human reference sequence uh, is sort of God's gift to, uh, or the NHGRI's gift to kind of the uh, genomics community is that, uh, is that it has excellent continuity. It's not perfect, but it's excellent. And achieving that le level of continuity today, starting from scratch, is extremely hard. Uh, but having uh, one prototype, it's relatively easy to assemble uh, very similar genomes. And uh, anyway, we hadn't solved the long-range continuity problem yet, and uh, that, so that was 86. Uh, it was another few years before uh, either they or we uh, started to produce uh, contigs that were long enough, at least in our model organisms, so that uh, uh, the, uh, you know, is, uh, a good criterion is, is, is how many centimorgans are the contigs. Forget about KB, but centimorgans, because the, we were trying to integrate physical and genetic maps, and, you know, they have to be a few centimorgans, uh, or else geneticists uh, are going to be frustrated with them, and uh, getting them to a few centimorgans was hard, but uh, we, uh, we got there. I think that uh, one would have to ask Sidney uh, kind of what he knew and how, how much of his vision was his vision. I mean, he's a visionary and how much he, you know, he was obviously uh, several orders of magnitude better connected than I was to kind of, the, kind of the network of people thinking about these problems. But I think his thing about us needing to publish in 86 was a recognition that, uh, you know, there were going to be big efforts. And uh, the, uh, so it was about then, and I, I actually, uh, you know, in retrospect, there was not some moment uh, when I heard about the Human Genome Project. Uh, it, uh, you probably know the date. I'm not sure the, the, you know, the famous Cold Spring Harbor Symposium. Was that 86 or 7? 87. 7, yeah. So that would have been the spring of 87. So yeah. by then the proposal, I didn't go to that meeting. I, you know, I was not well known. I was, I was reasonably well known within the yeast community, but I was not well known outside of it. And uh, the uh, Salson was much better known uh, although not really in human genetics, for example, he was, I mean, he was already, you know, he, John Selson won the Nobel Prize for, the, for his work on the nematode cell lineage, which had, which had preceded all of this, uh, this uh, physical mapping. 
and uh, and that work was you know was really seminal, and he was very well known amongst molecular biologists. So he had a high stature of in in uh, in biology that I I didn't have. I was just an idiosyncratic yeast genetic geneticist was sort of the way that I would have been, I think, described then the way I thought of myself. Uh, so I wasn't very well connected, and uh, you know, I, but I you know I started to hear. Uh, you know, uh, second-hand, third-hand reports, Department of Energy, uh, some Los Alamos technology that was going to really, really knock out this problem on a human genome scale. And, uh, the, uh, and by, the time, uh, by the time of that Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, I, you know, I, I didn't go to the, uh, Solston went to the, uh, Sinsheimer meeting at Santa Cruz. I, I say I just wasn't well known at that time. Uh, wasn't, wasn't on the kind of invitation list for those kinds of events. There weren't very many of those events, but uh, anyway, he. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I sort of knew knew that a plan was being pulled together. I, I remember being at Cold Spring Harbor uh, at a Banbury meeting and. Uh, I'm virtually sure this was before the symposium, and I can't remember uh, the date or the topic. I've been to many Banbury meetings, but the uh, but I remember sitting next to Jim Watson at dinner at the Banbury Center and uh, asked him what what he knew <laughs> about this human genome project uh, idea, and uh, so that uh, shows the level of my naivete. Uh, he didn't know very much, actually. Uh, but uh, the main thing he said was uh, he would support it if they got somebody good to run it. <laughs> this was a long time before he was a candidate for this uh, job. Uh, but his point was, I learned, I got to know Jim well after, after that. I I'd met him a couple of times before then, but I got to know him well during the kind of genome project, and still talk to him pretty regularly. But uh, there's always a point, you know. That's a, you know when Jim says something, there's always a point. Now, often people don't like it, um, uh, and uh, you know he says things that he shouldn't say, and so forth. This is this is who he is. <laughs> but uh, d let's just stick to science policy issues. There's always a point. And uh, he usually makes it very indirectly. And uh, the, uh, I told an anecdote, this is a total digression, but I told an anecdote about this, which you can find in a book review that I wrote in uh, Bioessays, uh, reviewing uh, the, uh, a book of tributes to Jim Watson, uh, uh, something, uh, Something Science uh, was the title of the book, easy to find. It was a Cold Spring Harbor publication of just essays of people who had worked with Jim and mm -hmm. knew Jim. And I wrote a review of it. I didn't write any chapters for it. Uh, Weinbergen has, Wein, uh, Wein, uh, Weingarten? Wein, Jim Weingarten. Jim Weingarten has a, actually a somewhat important essay in there. So, as far as I know, the only place, there, there probably are NIH archives, but it's the only place that I know publicly where he, he just sort of wrote down his thought process in, uh, in sort of basically grabbing the Human Genome Project for the NIH over a lot of intramural opposition. Um, but in any event, uh, it's an interesting collection of essays. In this book review, I tell an anecdote about where the $3 billion budget for the Human Genome Project came from, and it's a, it's a Jim Watson story, and it illustrates this point, that he makes his points very indirectly. So his point about if they got somebody good to run it is that uh, he, uh, he doesn't think anything good ever comes of a bureaucracy. And his worry about the Human Genome Project is that it, there was going to be a big bureaucracy built up, and it would be an embarrassment to the whole field because it would flounder around. Uh, that uh, and uh, 
and, and Jim actually often starts with these you know, essentially political points. Um, and uh, only later did I really extract from him um, his thinking about why it would be scientifically useful. I think he took it for granted that it would be scientifically useful if it weren't a boondoggle. <laughs> and so what he was thinking about that night was how to keep this thing from being a boondoggle. But uh, anyway, I, you know, so I heard these things. Uh, and uh, my, I got swept up in the kind of that policy world, uh, you know, because the, I had nothing to do with the launching of the, what turned into the Alberts Committee, the NRC uh, Committee on Mapping and Sequencing. I don't know the story. Uh, you know, Bob Cook Diggins' book uh, is probably the best published source about kind of the, kind of how that happened. Uh, but you know, the one thing the NRC does well is, uh, you know, they have a they have a good staff and they uh, research things, and uh, you know, scientists uh, they but but the staff, I think they they get the staff kind of outside volunteer balance well. They do that well at the NRC. The staff uh, is very active and compl and complements. This is at their best. Uh, complements the the weakness of people like me that, you know, we don't systematically look at fields. Uh, we know people, we hear things, we read papers, but anyway, they studied the landscape and, and, you know, this, I think it was, they discovered my project in St. Louis is just one of a small number of activities that were really directly relevant to this proposal. And, uh, so I was, uh, invited, uh, at one of their very first meetings. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if they had met previously to this meeting, but it was the first meeting where they were taking kind of outside input uh, to talk about my project in St. Louis. And so I came and I talked about it. We had just really gotten, we were really just getting, yeah, I had the yeast stuff. It was at a, you know, contig closure phase uh, and, uh, uh, but we were, we were, the yaks were working by the time I talked there. It was pretty clear they, they were working. Hadn't done much with them, but they were working. And uh, the, uh, so Bruce in particular was, really encouraged me to uh, stay in touch and, uh, and asked me to write him a letter, which I did. I, I don't have a copy of this letter, but I, I, it must, must exist in the archives somewhere, but I, I wrote him a letter. Uh, it was the first time I, can, I remember really writing down what I thought about this whole proposal and what the issues were going to be. Uh, and I remember the main, the, the main uh, it was not a long letter. Uh, it wasn't supposed to be a big white paper. It was a letter. Uh, and uh, I remember the main advice I gave was uh, not to listen to people who were saying that it was going to be easy. And uh, that uh, there were two reasons that they shouldn't listen to them. There were quite a few, including Wally Gilbert, who was on the committee, uh, who thought this is not going to be very hard. Uh, said, you don't want to say this for two reasons. First of all, it'd be wrong and uh, it sets you up for failure uh, because uh, it is, it's going to be hard. And uh, if you say it's easy going in and it turns out to be hard, then that's not good. Uh, and the other reason is this simply politically. Uh, look, you're, you've got to argue for a special effort. That was the key phrase in the NRC report is we need a special effort. It's not going to happen by itself. Uh, it needs, you know, this is going to need careful attention. It's going to be, need institutional nurturing. It's going to need a bureaucracy. Uh, God forbid. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you make it sound too easy, then uh, you're undermi undermining the case that, uh, that any real special efforts needed. The scientific community does well enough. If uh, things aren't so hard, making ad hoc co coalitions and scraping together enough funding at least to really get the thing seriously off the ground. And uh, so, want to make this, uh, and, and, the, and the good thing about this argument is it's actually true. It's going to be hard. 
What's diffi what's difficult is explaining why it's going to be hard, and we've already sort of covered some of that territory. But uh, anyway, Bruce liked my letter. I don't know whether he shared it with the committee or not. And the you know the next stage of the story is is, is well known, uh, is that so while he got so impatient with uh, the deliberations that he did a kind of this story actually is not so well documented, but uh, it's known, but it's not very well documented. He, he decided on a sort of what was a kind of a pre-Solera sort of uh, move, you know. We're just going to get a little company together, raise a little capital, and go and do this. And uh, took some steps in that direction. And, uh, and so he, uh, he resigned from the committee because uh, of obvious conflict of interest. And, uh, and the, uh, I don't know whether it was Bruce who decided or, you know, whoever, but... Uh, I got a phone call from John Burris, who was the executive secretary, asking me if I would take Wally's place on the committee. And so I had real apprehension about doing that. I mean, you know, this is Sidney Brenner and Lee Hood and, you know, uh, Frank Ruddle and Jim Watson and, you know, um, Bruce Alberts and, and so forth. I'm leaving, you know, leaving out many famous people. Uh, there was nobody on this committee that was, uh, you know, a backbencher of my standing, the only, uh, really the closest peer I had on the committee was Shirley Tillman, and uh, she, but she was much better known than I was, because, uh, uh, I don't know, she was a Phil Leader kind of uh, lineage and had already done uh, well-known work in molecular biology on uh, functional aspects of globin uh, regulation and so forth. Anyway, she was much better known, but about the same career stage I was at. And, uh, but Shirley and I worked well together. We were the only people on the committee that had ever sequenced any DNA uh, to speak of. I've told the joke a number of times that it, uh, which is, I think is accurate. Uh, you'd probably get different versions of it from Shirley and Dave Botstein and me, but uh, and I don't know which one would be right, but uh, what I remember is at a coffee break one time, uh, Shirley and I were conferring about uh, the gap between the reality of DNA sequencing in 1987 and uh, and the you know, billions of base pairs, and uh, you know, we compared notes as to how much sequencing the two of us had done, and you know, I don't know. she'd done more than I had because uh, she worked on bigger genes. But, you know, it was way up in the many thousands of base pairs. Uh, and uh, so we, we wondered how many people on the committee had, had sequenced with their own hands at least 1,000 base pairs of DNA. And Good God. So the only taker was Dave Botstein claimed to have uh, sequenced 1,000 base pairs with his own hands. Nobody else even claimed to have. You know, we, keep, keep in mind, you know, we have Lee Hood and... Uh, and on the committee, and I, Wally wasn't there anymore, but I'm sure he wouldn't have claimed to have sequenced a thousand base pairs. Uh, uh, you know, we had kind of, they didn't do this stuff. And uh, Shirley and I had done it, and uh, not on any large scale, but we had actually done it. And so we initially disallowed uh, Botstein's claim because uh, it was based on having sequenced the Euro 3 gene in yeast. He has a paper on that. Uh, but the gene's only 1,100 base pairs, and there were two other authors on the paper, and so we just thought it was unlikely that Dave had uh, actually sequenced 1,000 of the base pairs himself. himself. This was undoubtedly unfair, and it was all, uh, this was all for fun. Uh, so Shirley and I, and uh, to a more limited extent, uh, Dave Botstein, you know, had, had a little experience actually in the lab doing these things. And we did tend to be, the three of us tended to be allies on the committee on this side of uh, caution. You know, we were caution in the sense, no, don't make this sound too easy. It's not going to be easy. The scale up factors that we're talking about here are, uh, are uh, too big. We, you know, the report rather famously, and I think this was my suggestion, uh, adopted uh, you know, uh, the de facto rule of Fred Sanger, I, I don't know whether he ever wrote this rule down, but it was commonly discussed amongst people who followed the technical side of, of sequencing, uh, you know, that you, you, wanted, you, know, you wanted to move from project to project uh, 
with a scale up factor that was big enough that you couldn't just do it the way you'd done the previous one, uh, but that wouldn't break your system completely. And he settled on an approximate factor of three. And, uh, you know, he looked, he went from uh, phi X to uh, human mitochondrial DNA to lambda DNA to EB virus, you know, the four successive factors of three. Uh, and, uh, and if you look, every one of those was done by really substantial innovation, but not so much innovation that uh, you really had to start from scratch. Well, if you take, you know, take a baseline of a few thousand base pairs, which was the state of the art in 1987, and get the billions of base pairs, it's a lot of factors of three. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we just hammered at the point that uh, if, uh, if you're going to line up with anybody's uh, view of how to improve this technology, uh, Sanger's probably the one to line up with. Uh, you know, we should claim that we know how to scale up DNA sequencing better than Fred Sanger did. And, uh, and so that did kind of prevail, if you read the report, that sort of attitude. Uh, and, uh, and actually, if you look at what happened, uh, you know, it, uh, it's not, it's not a bad approximation. You know, at, at some stage, you know, the, the technology, that generation of technology got generic enough that, uh, that it could be parallelized. The factor of three is, uh, is, is uh, when there's no protocol to copy. Uh, you've got to work out the protocol. And uh, the, uh, there was a lot of working out of protocols. Uh, it's more than protocols. You know, it's, uh, it's more, a little more, uh, their strategy, uh, the strategy was pretty set. Uh, it's more, say, tactics. Uh, and uh, there was still quite a lot of tactical maneuver going on until, uh, until really the end of the 90s uh, when there was a, kind of a massive convergence on a particular tactic and very little difference between the practice here and practice there. And uh, it became an issue of making best practice within a, within a pretty tightly confined strategy, make, make sure best practice uh, spreads quickly. And, and I think the, that was one thing that NHR, I think, did well, actually. The, uh, it's easy to complain about uh, the G5 system, I was not a part of it, uh, and uh, there still are hard feelings about uh, many things. Uh, but uh, I think it uh, was an effective method of having best practice spread rapidly, and that that was, a, that was probably the highest priority that needed attention at that time. Well, framing it as a Leonard and Bussian, uh, question sort of invites a, a um, slightly humorous response is that uh, one of Botstein's major contributions is that he kind of created Eric Lander. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that was a major contribution. Uh, the, uh, I, I don't have a lot to say about Lander, actually. Uh, uh, I'm happy to talk about Botstein. Uh, you know, he and I were allies for a very long time. The, uh, there's an anecdote uh, about Botstein and me. It's a true, this is a true anecdote. I remember this uh, pretty clearly. At a, uh, you know, he was a yeast guy and, uh, and a big, uh, big fan of the work even that I did in uh, Ben Hall's lab, which he followed closely. I remember him sitting in the front row of a Gordon conference where I presented uh, kind of a key aspect of this yeast tRNA study. The, more genomic aspect of it, and he was just uh, sort of beside himself with enthusiasm, whereas lots of other people, you know, they thought this was kind of clever, but, uh, you know, waiting for the functional punchline. And uh, Botstein uh, uh, took it for what it was, as opposed to looking for me learning something new about tRNA genes. But in any event, uh, I always like to tell the anecdote about when David and I first met. The uh, was at a yeast meeting at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, which was uh, 1977, and uh, I had uh, just sequenced with Howard Goodman and and Ben 
uh, Max and Gilbert sequenced the first of these mutant yeast RNA genes. And uh, that was my first sequencing. And uh, Howard Goodman's lab had Maxim and Gilbert sequencing kind of up and running. And I went down to San Francisco just for a few days and learned how to do it and did some of it there. Uh, and we got pretty good results and found our mutant. This is the first sequenced eukaryotic mutation. The, uh, it, uh, and I, anyway, uh, so I presented this at uh, Cold Spring Harbor at a, at a uh, session that Botstein chaired. And uh, he had his usual enthusiasm for all of this, but I'd never really interacted with him. And uh, so that night at, uh, at the bar, uh, I drank a little too much, not unknown at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and uh, somehow or another, <laughs> got into a uh, argument with Ron Davis and Dave Botstein. This is the three of us. And uh, it was about DNA sequencing and really the sort of philosophy of science uh, element of DNA sequencing in which uh, I still remember the topic is that they took the position that DNA sequences in their nature had to be determined exactly. And uh, I took the position that, uh, you know, experimental science is fallible. It's inexact. Uh, you do the best you can and uh, you put air bars on things. So this, of course, was an interesting discussion because it uh, propagates through, uh, you know, another 20 years of discussion. Uh, and uh, my position could be interpreted as uh, my not caring about quality, but uh, anybody who knows me knows that's not right. <laughs> I like to think that I won this argument long term. Uh, uh, because, of course, I was right philosophically, and uh, eventually, basically, Phil Green uh, <laughs> showed how to put air bars that you could really work with <laughs> on these sequences, and that that was the critical step in doing it at scale, certainly one, arguably the most critical step in doing it at scale. Uh, so, but at the night, anyway, there we were. You know, I'd had too much to drink. They'd probably had too much, too, but I'm sure I'd had more than they had. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten into this argument. Uh, so here, you know, I'm a postdoc, you know, there's a nobody, and, uh, you know, these guys were, they, they were the kind of the rising stars in uh, yeast genetics and molecular biology. And so after a while, this, this, this argument drew a crowd, you know, so, so, so like a, in a movie, you know, there's going to be a barroom fight or something. It was just a circle of people that uh, said, yeah, there's a postdoc out there arguing with Ron Davis and uh, Dave Botstein. And so we, I don't know, we argued for an hour or two. You know, we're all big talkers, especially Botstein and me. And uh, so uh, I can't remember how it went out. I, you know, I was drunk. And uh, so I, what I remember is, so I wake up the next morning uh, hungover, and I say, oh, my God, what did I do? Uh, I, uh, I have to find some other career. <laughs> I made a complete ass out of myself in front of the, uh, the two most important people to impress in, uh, in the field that I'm trying to make a living in. And uh, this was well before I was out even looking for a job. And uh, so uh, I decided I was going to, that it would be bad form just not to show up at the meeting at the morning. I'd already given my talk, but uh, I was going to just, you know, sort of sneak in the back. And uh, a little after the session started. And uh, so I'd be sure I didn't run into one of these guys. And... Uh, or anybody else who had seen this event. So uh, this was back in the Blackford Hall days before the Grace Auditorium was built. And uh, so I kind of sneak in the back back there and uh, just kind of see what's going on. And uh, so suddenly somebody slaps me on the shoulder from behind and in an in inimitable booming voice, uh, David Botstein says, uh, Hi, Maynard. That was fun last night. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Botstein and I have been great friends, friends uh, ever since, and uh, and we were allies in the uh, you know on the Alberts committee, and then through a lot of these advisory committees, we tended to agree. Uh, we didn't didn't uh, you know we didn't 
coordinate our arguments ahead of time, but we tended to agree. And, uh, and then we would team up. And uh, we were pretty good at improvising a uh, kind of a back and forth uh, 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 approach where I'd fill in the weaker parts of his argument and he'd fill in the weaker parts of mine. But, uh, and bot science is very hard to argue about. Uh, often I knew more about the technical details and so uh, if, uh, but I could, I could shore up his arguments uh, and he was uh, powerful in formulating a, you know, a conceptual level policy kind of idea. So a lot of it, you know, I think we've already covered what a lot of it concerned is that uh, I remember the discussion on the NRC committee, for example, about some, some people on the committee wanted to put, uh, you know, year 2000 as the goal, have this sequence done by the year 2000. And, uh, and I remember without, again, without prior coordination, uh, David and I were the two people who just thought that was not going to work. Now, it was very difficult to sit there in uh, 1987 and, you know, decide that 15 years might be enough, but that 13 years was cutting it and, uh, you know, but we were about right. And when we just sort of, both of us and coming at it from somewhat different directions, sort of looked at what was going to have to happen and then happen after that, uh, it was hard to picture this thing getting done by the year 2000. Uh, but, you know, we thought, you know, certainly 2010, 2010, 20, this was probably very safe, but uh, the, uh, so that's an example. And issues of that ilk, you know, recurred over and over and over again. And the other thing that we both, uh, you know, agreed on that was uh, a power, powerful position was, uh, you know, we both were, were yeast guys. And, uh, and we both uh, thought model organisms uh, were actually the key to this thing that uh, not just an add-on, but the key that uh, the, uh, we both took a fairly dim view of the human genetics community as a scientific community. And the, Why? there are still people that resent somewhat my attitude. Uh, so he had some exposure to human genetics that I, I just didn't have. The genetics department in Seattle, where I made this rather abrupt uh, transition into genetics, it had no no significant human genetics. Dan Gartler was there, uh, but uh, he was not working with families, for example, uh, was primarily at that stage in his career. He was, an, he was a very positive influence on me, but I didn't learn any human genetics from him. He was primarily interested in the mechanism of X inactivation at that stage in his career. And uh, the, uh, I just didn't have any exposure to human genetics. I, you know, in more recent times, have become close with Arno Matulski, uh, but I didn't know him at that time. I went to one lecture he gave. Uh, the human genetics division was, had, had uh, essentially no interaction with this basic model organism genetics department. So that was where I came from. Uh, David came from this uh, human genetics uh, department at Michigan and uh, had, uh, had had some serious exposure to human genetics and uh, knew a lot more about it than I did. And of course, played a, you know a historic role in uh, in recognizing that that of the various things that kind of we had to offer from the early stages of genomics, that RFLPs were the thing that human genetics needed the most, and wrote that kind of that 1980 I think paper. Uh, I uh, I didn't know enough about human genetics to even think about that. The, about about you know why RFLPs were particularly the thing that human geneticists needed. I I sort of saw human genetics as needing a sort of a massive collection of tools, which was essentially accurate. But but Botstein could see that the, this 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 tool was ready uh, to have a big impact in human genetics. I didn't have that level of understanding. The uh, that they didn't have enough genetic markers basically to do much of anything. I could just see that they couldn't do much of anything. Uh, 
Now, they'd learned a lot of interesting things. I don't want to be misquoted on this. Uh, they, uh, I, I liked reading about uh, you know, human genetic diseases, and, uh, and particularly when there had been some biochemical success, like the inborn errors of metabolism. I was quite impressed. Uh, sickle cell anemia, these were, you know, these were very interesting scientific stories, and uh, in some cases, it already had some medical benefit. Uh, but it all looked so peripheral to me, to the core question of, you know, just why are people all so different? You know, it was this, uh, and now population geneticists, I had a little, Joe Felsenstein was there, I had a little exposure to uh, population genetics, not much. I had more in St. Louis when, uh, particularly when Dan Hartle uh, came to that department. Uh, but I wasn't so interested then, I've gotten more interested since, but I wasn't so interested then in a population geneticist's answer to these questions. I wanted molecular answers. I mean, I, there are a lot of heritable differences between any pair of humans, and uh, I wanted to know what molecules were different, and, uh, and I could see that the tools just weren't there. And so, what I tended to look at human genetics until rather recent times, uh, this has changed and is changing, and, and, and uh, young human geneticists today are a totally different group than, uh, than my comments apply to. But I'd say well into the 90s, I just saw human genetics as, uh, as an overly self-satisfied kind of enclave that defined a certain set of problems uh, which they could make a certain amount of progress on, mostly importing uh, technology from outside, uh, almost entirely importing technology from outside. Uh, and, uh, and then, that's okay, uh, uh, the, uh, what I didn't like is that they were always too satisfied with the technology. I, th I spent, you know, I can't tell you how long uh, through the, the late 80s and 90s arguing with human geneticists. Uh, the Hughes was the worst. I was a Hughes investigator for a while, a total misfit with this organization, and they uh, couldn't take my Hughes investigatorship from St. Louis back to Seattle in 92, so I, I left the Hughes then. But for a few years before that, I was a Hughes investigator, and I used to go to all their meetings. And they had a lot of human geneticists, and uh, the uh, yeah, I'd argue with these guys, and uh, they, you know, they they would differ about whether a ten centimorgan, you know, uh, DNA polymorphism map was good enough, or whether there might be some benefits to taking it to five centimorgans. Uh, that, you know, they, there just was no vision there about, you know, how are we going to ever do this? They, uh, how are we actually ever going to really understand, you know, what are the molecules that, uh, you know, make people different from one another? And uh, they, they had at any given stage a certain set of kind of, of a method. They were all doing the same thing. Some of them did it better than others, but it was always the same thing. And uh, anyway, I was frustrated by this community. I just didn't see any vision there. They were not very enthusiastic about the Human Genome Project. The, uh, the Human Genome Project was a... Cr so anyway, Botstein and I agreed that, uh, you know, model organisms were the key. You know, they, it's sometimes presented as though you know, we made the case that it was an important add-on. It's actually the key. That's how, you know, that's how we're going to figure out how to do these things. And not just... The, it goes beyond the methods, the, the conceptual framework. Uh, what, what is it that we're actually trying to do? Uh, and what would the benefits of that be? These questions needed attention, and they needed refinement, and they needed, you know, some sort of smart, knowledgeable people arguing about them. It wasn't going on in human genetics. And uh, it was going on in yeast and worms, and uh, eventually, you know, the fly, fly, you know, the flies were slow to the table. Mm -hmm. They were slow to the table for actually a very simple reason. Uh, First, well, two, you know, there are a couple of reasons. They had some of the insularity of human genetics. Uh, you were either a fly guy or you weren't a fly guy. And, uh, they, uh, and they had polyteine chromosomes. Uh, and uh, so they had, uh, you know, they had cytogenetics at a resolution that uh, other people could only dream of. Uh, that's not going to solve the problems I m mentioned. It's not going to tell you why one fly is different than another fly uh, out around a garbage heap somewhere. Uh, but they could do a lot with them. And, uh, 
So they stuck with chromosome walking way too long uh, because they could walk better than other people because they could, they could see where they were on this cytogenetic map and uh, so forth. But they, you know, they came around, uh, but uh, they, weren't the, they, they didn't lead at all. Uh, they dragged their feet. Uh, you know, it, was, uh, it was really worms and yeast uh, that led. And, uh, the, uh, and then, uh, you know, model organisms like Arabidopsis, for example, I mean, they, they understood, you know, this can transform uh, our business and uh, so forth. And, it, and it, it, as I say, it was more than methods. It was a sort of a conceptual framework, you know, what, is, what needs to be done? What's the relative importance of all these different parts? How do they fit together? And also just getting experience, the factor of three kind of thing from Sanger. But so that was another uh, thing that David and I agreed, agreed uh, about. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, David's contribution, he, uh, his contributions as an investigator were modest. Uh, he uh, was primarily an intellectual force. Every field needs more intellectual forces. I've never been around a field that has enough intellectual, you know, it has too much intellectual force, ex excessive, extra intellectual force. I've been around a lot of smart people, but uh, intellectual force is a different matter. And uh, the, uh, and, and I, th I think it was that, the, the things I've already mentioned, uh, and, and, well, they're all things I've already mentioned, but it was this combination of, uh, of you know, significant experience with the techniques, much more than many of the other big talkers, and uh, the, uh, the strong rooting in model organisms, and, and this uh, awareness of, of really what new, new understanding human genetics at a sort of conceptual level uh, was a powerful combination, and his, with his personality. Uh, the, uh, the lander, that'll have to be another day or somebody else. Yeah. The, yeah, it's a different, uh, it's a whole, whole different, whole different, uh, whole different discussion. Yeah. yeah. So obviously, you know, that's uh, one of the, one of the primary pleasures of a career such as mine is, uh, you know, occasionally to, you know, interact with uh, young investigators at, uh, at critical stages of their career and sort of feel as though you did something good. You know, actually, my biggest regrets in my whole scientific career, they're not, you know, various scientific errors that I made, is that uh, you know, there are you know, students I feel I let down, you know, I didn't quite figure out. You know, I'm sure there are basketball coaches that feel this way, you know, they didn't ever quite figure out what to do. You know, this guy had a lot of talent, but they never quite figured out how to plug him in so he could shine. Uh, but you should always uh, focus on your successes. Eric's one of my successes. and. Uh, yeah, so Eric, yeah, Eric is better known to many of you than you know, to me. I've seen him over more years and so forth. He's, uh, he's an immensely better organized guy than I am at every level. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that we worked so well together during this formative period because our personalities are actually quite different. Uh, I haven't been surprised uh, either by Eric's uh, level of success or... Uh, or even the general trajectory that he's taken, because I always saw, you know, he's a leader. I'm not, I'm actually not, not a leader. I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a, you know, sort of an old-fashioned professor. I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, at my best when I have a lot of time to think for myself. I, you know, I talked about my sort of zero-based approach to things. Well, that's not an efficient process, and uh, I just, uh, you know, I've never, you know, I never, uh, I've been, a, I've been an acting chair of a few things uh, just out of community service. I do have some sense of community service about me, but no desire for leadership. You know, I just never, uh, never pursued any opportunities in uh, leadership. It's not what I want to do. Uh, the, uh, Eric, you know, he's a leader. You know, I could see that. And, uh, you know, he'd be out to, uh, you know, I was an odd choice of somebody for him to postdoc with, and I don't, you know, he's the one who'd have to say why he did that. It was pretty venturesome. He'd had a very successful, he was an MD, PhD, uh, had personal reasons to want to stay in St. Louis uh, longer after he'd finished his MD, PhD. The, his PhD studies had been extremely successful, were very well regarded in the, in the medical school there, which was a leader in sort of glycobiology, and, you know, he'd worked on sulfation of uh, 
of uh, the glycosylated proteins and uh, it was uh, it was biochemistry it wasn't really even biochemical genetics uh, it was basically biochemistry and uh, had done very well at it so so he's out at this sort of functional extreme of this spectrum that i've been discussing and uh, here i uh, you know i i by then was a well-known figure at wash u i uh, this was i don't know 1997 something like that 1987 i mean um, and uh, you know, wasn't you know so well known uh, nationally, but I was well well known at WashU <clears throat> because uh, more and more things were being built on this kind of this little startup project of mine. I mean, there were, you know there was no genomics or anything that resembled genomics when I went there in '79, and when I left in '92, it was this kind of huge center uh, of genomic activity and grew more after that. But if you, if you look at that whole history, you'll see that there was never any leadership of mine. I just, I was never in charge of anything. And uh, frustrated the, you know, the, the high command uh, to no end, because, you know, they wanted me to, you know, bring in tons of money and organize some big thing, but I it just, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, but uh, fortunately, there were other people that did want to do it and were highly capable of it. But anyway, somehow into that, you know, why Eric decided to do this, I don't really know. It was quite a major shift for him from uh, just the kind of experimental work he had been doing. Uh, I wasn't, you know, he, he had an a M MD and uh, planned to, you know, to, to get, uh, I don't know if he was uh, certified at that time or board, board qualified at that time as a, a uh, uh, laboratory medicine person, but uh, that was certainly where he was headed. And uh, I wasn't developing genetic tests. There were people at WashU that were developing genetic tests. There were all sorts of things going on that were much more relevant to what he was doing. Uh, but so he decided to do that. Uh, I, you know, I, I, Eric's not hard to read. Uh, some students are hard to read, but he's not hard to read. You know, he's energetic and uh, you know, hardworking, extremely competent, uh, hard to stop. And uh, we, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to get a project going that would sort of do for yaks what we painstakingly worked out with Lambda and Cosmid clones in yeast. And I could see that the parallel methods just weren't going to work. They uh, wasn't going to work. And I was right about that. No one's ever made them work. And uh, that, that is, we weren't going to be fingerprinting yaks by digesting them with restriction enzymes and doing N, N complexity picking of clones and N squared computing and so forth. It just wasn't going to work. There are a bunch of reasons for that, but it wasn't going to work. Uh, so PCR was sort of the new kid on the block technically at that time. It was brand new. And... Uh, so that really appealed to Eric because that was uh, its relevance to lab medicine was obvious, and uh, and he uh, so he, you know, he got that up and running, and more than that, I mean, it wasn't so hard to get up and running, but got everybody doing it, and you know, he made the PCR transition in uh, in, in in our lab and indeed in the whole department there, uh, and uh, we uh, yeah, so we developed this idea that. Uh, that uh, you know, we could combine the screening of the YAC libraries, which we shifted to an almost completely PCR-based method. I never liked hybridization screening of things. I'd done a lot of it, and I never liked it. Still don't like it. It it resurfaces from time to time, but uh, it's not uh, it's just not the right way of screening libraries, in my opinion. Uh, uh, the uh, so. Anyway, we, we, we pretty quickly realized that uh, you could build quite nice maps. If you, if you did, this is just back to what I was talking about with, with Ken Naismith and Ben's lab. If you go in and screen a very deep library, so we have Ron Davis's kind of conception, always work with a very deep library. So you get a lot of independent clones. Screen somehow or another for one point in the genome. And uh, so you have random N clones with all of them contain this one point. And, uh, and, we, and so PCR was our point. That was getting down to a, you know, pretty close to a point. And, uh, and we, you know, we quickly realized that we could actually build very good maps just from, the, uh, just from knowing, getting enough PCR assays across the region, even if they were randomly spaced. We could order the, order the, uh, the uh, 
PCR assays and the YAKs in the same, all in the same, we could screen and order and so forth all in the same way. And so uh, that was the idea. I actually, I, you know, it, clearly that's a, a, a compound idea and uh, it wasn't some afternoon on the blackboard that we put all this together, but uh, we were trying to get going with YAKs, what we had going in yeast with uh, these simpler clones. and. Uh, yeah, you know, so he he got that up and running very quickly, and uh, and because he was more interested than I was in uh, in collaborating with human geneticists, uh, he was very effective at you know not just using any old PCR assay, but that was a period in human genetics when you know laboratories you know they had armed guards guarding their PCR assays, and they wouldn't publish the sequences of the primers and uh, the. Uh, because it was the closest to you know some, some positional cloning project or another, but he was very effective at uh, at building collaborations. I just left that to him completely. I didn't have any interactions with these groups uh, personally, except just you know sometimes they'd ask me if I was really on board. And I always said, no, if it's okay with Eric, it's okay with me. But so for example, that's how he built his ties to Francis Collins. Is that uh, the uh, CFTR uh, search was right in its end game, and uh, the uh, so uh, it, uh, the timing actually was sort of perfect because the, uh, Francis and his collaborators sort of found the gene by their methods. Uh, in the process, they developed huge numbers of PCR assays as they were looking for it. And uh, we were no longer a threat to them. And, uh, and so uh, they and Francis saw the, you know, the, 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 the general interest of doing that kind of mapping. <laughs> and uh, so he and Eric uh, uh, collaborated on getting all the, you know, they, they, they were the ones that, you know, got all these assays together and we did very deep screening across that whole region and kind of showed we could build these maps. And uh, the, uh, but it was a fairly brief period really <coughs> by about, I, 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 I can't reconstruct the timeline, but I doubt that Eric was in any meaningful sense a postdoc of mine for more than two years uh, because this guy, you know, he was on a fast upward trajectory. So I remember one day, so I told him, uh, look, I have too much space. Uh, with all this space, I'm, uh, you know, my lab's getting too big. I don't, uh, that's not, big labs are not for me. Uh, I, uh, I want you to take uh, what was my main lab space, including my office, and uh, I'm going to move down the hall to a uh, smaller space and uh, smaller office and, uh, and start over uh, with some new projects. And uh, you should run with this. And uh, so the lab medicine or somebody appointed him, uh, you know, so when, when you're a fast rising star in a, and have in a, in a sort of the more clinical side of an academic medical school jobs are not never a problem, and uh, so he, and he got some kind of a job there. And uh, you know, he did at first, you know, he was, didn't want to do this and so forth. But uh, I persuaded him, and uh, that it would be good for us both. And uh, so he was went around with all that. I, I wasn't involved in the. Uh, you know, I, I'm not an author on the chromosome seven mapping paper because I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, he had a nice big contig out there on chromosome seven, and he just went to work on mapping the rest of the chromosome. And he worked with David Schlesinger, and that's another complicated story. But uh, but the the X chromosome was David Schlesinger's kind of baby, and and chromosome seven was Eric's and. And uh, pretty much finished that in St. Louis, I think. Um, but then uh, Francis hired him here, and he you know, went on and did did things. You know, I, so I think the, the the last thing I'll just uh, stick in. Uh, there are a lot lot more could be said about Eric, but uh, the uh, uh, as far as his scientific contributions go, uh, you know, obviously he was a a key player in that kind of formative stage of genomics. Uh, but uh, of the work that you know he really did as an independent investigator here, I, I, I do think that his comparative genomics is underappreciated. Uh, you know, comparative genomics has become uh, you know so ubiquitous, and uh, and we're now accustomed to comparing whole genomes, and you know, it's a, you know field is at a much more advanced stage. But if you look at the you know he took his his intramural center in that direction of. Uh, 
of doing you know, multiple species, well-chosen multiple species, uh, fairly long tracks of DNA you know, across multiple genes, uh, complete sequence. And uh, yeah, I think you know, he showed uh, people that this is, uh, this is the way to go. We need, uh, we need mul multiple sequence alignment over long regions with well-chosen phylogenetic uh, uh, comparisons. Uh, produces an immense amount of information, and, uh, and I, uh, I think that was uh, a uh, is an underappreciated contribution to uh, the development of genomics as we now know it. Mm -hmm.